coming to the next topic and also sticking to sustainability. I actually don't like this word. Um, let's call it a better future. Sticking, you know, to this topic. I, I just remembered myself um, years ago, one of my old bosses in the kitchen, of course, uh, the three Michelin stars said, hey, to us in the kitchen, to us chefs said, hey guys, why are you treating your, your fish like that? You have to have respect. Everybody were looking like, okay, what do you want to tell us? And he was completely right. He said, you know, in the morning there's a fisherman who ships out in the sea. He stays there possibly a couple of days. And uh, I couldn't be a fisherman. I, I would seriously get seasick. But anyway, it's a harsh environment again. He catches the fish. The fish gives his life to us. So we have to respect and have to treat it in the best possible way we can. And therefore, we have today, let's call him an expert about this topic here. He is an award-winning book publisher. He is a chef. He owns, I just figured out, four restaurants, main restaurant called St. Peter. I would like to introduce you and highly welcome Josh Neeland with us here on stage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Have fun. <laughs> Thank you. We have a huge problem. 50% uh, is estimated that, basically it's estimated that 50% of what gets caught uh, from our waters goes in the bin. Yeah. Wow, it's enormous. Uh, and if not in the bin physically, then in the bin that is the ocean, creating a whole lot of CO2 emissions and a miserable state of affairs in the water. But then we'll go further. Of that 50% that does make it to market uh, to then you know, be sold, let's subtract another 50% again uh, from that, and then that goes in the trash as well. So it's this constant state of subtraction that is happening uh, because there is a lack of desirability with certain types of fish, but then also what is left behind from a fish. So for me personally, the agenda that I have with the businesses that, I, that I've got, and it's grown relatively quickly. Um, we started off with St. Peter uh, six years ago uh, as a restaurant, and then it grew to Fish Butchery, uh, which is a retail fish shop. It's not a restaurant, doesn't have chairs in it. Um, and I opened that because the work that I had done at St. Peter has attracted so much attention around, wow, this is really interesting, I want to go and try it. But inevitably, there is two eyeballs in one fish, um, so there's very little uh, I can do once they're gone. Uh, and so the desire to consume the sundry, the sundries or the byproduct of a fish, um, started to exceed that of the primary, primary fish itself. So... I found myself in a unique position where then we thought we would open fish butchery so we had greater infrastructure to purchase uh, better quality fish from better suppliers uh, and control our own waste, I suppose, control our own system. So there was no desire ever to wholesale to other chefs, um, but only to control our own product. And then I opened Charcoal Fish, which is a very casual, fun you know, way of eating fish to create accessibility to Sydney specifically um, so that they could eat more fish, so that they could have it in their diet more frequently and more easily. And then through selling one tonne of a specific fish per week in that venue, <laughs> like that, one tonne of fish is a lot. Um, and in a very small venue that we had at Fish Butchery to put one tonne of fish through that place, um, all of a sudden the ceiling in the roof caved in and it's interesting because the last time I spoke to some of you was Madrid Fusion uh, and it was pre-pandemic and I had fish butchery in St. Peter and the language that I was talking with was very privileged and niche to what I was doing and to put that system to work in charcoal fish um, was really fascinating because forever I was producing very small quantities of everything. I was making salami and mortadella prosciuttos and pâtés and things like that um, on a very small scale. And then with opening this business and getting bigger and expanding our team, then all of a sudden the game changed a lot. Um, all of a sudden we were dealing in quantity 
And the quality was still there, yes, but the quantity had increased and I was watching the team struggle to get through all the labour and, yeah, physically then watching the ceiling drop down out of the roof at our fish butchery and thinking to myself, well, this isn't sustainable how we're working. So all of a sudden we, we took a new fish butchery site, which is, you know, triple the size of the first one, so that we could become better uh, with the food that we were purchasing. And with all transparency to all of you, uh, me who flies the flag and needs to make sure I use every single part of the fish, that honestly wasn't happening in that first fish butchery when we changed and we added that business on because it was easier to just cut things a certain way to get the product that we needed and then on it goes. And that, I was crippled by that because it was frustrating that we hadn't, you know, been more prepared to do that volume and I don't think anybody can be prepared for that in Sydney. Um, but upon taking this new space, you know, we really dialed into how we approach fish and, and what parts of a fish we were using for what. So back to the problem that we face with so much of the fish going in the bin, the solution to that problem isn't as easy as you think. You've got one billion people, over a billion people, that rely on fish as their primary source of protein. So it's not as if you can just go and say, everybody stop eating fish. Um, you know, what we need to show is a little bit more intelligence and intentionality around the single use of one fish um, and to speak into where the failures start and to, to articulate the process is when fishermen go out and they throw their line out and the hook goes into the water with the bait and then all of a sudden a fish jumps on, you've got your fish, naturally it's trying to get away, <laughs> so off it goes and, you know, you trying to bring it in. And as you're bringing it in, the fish develops so much lactic acid within its muscle of the fish that it like, can't sustain the amount of oxygen needed to keep that fight going. So it gives up, it comes up. The standard that we see too frequently right now is the fish itself will get taken and probably taken out of a net, like less romantic than a, a line and hook, but more so let's just get a big net and take as many as we can because then there's more revenue there for us uh, if we take more. So the real celebration of quantity over quality um, is what is the destructive component of all of this. So a fish to come up to then get thrown into a tub and then it suffocates and dies and nobody looks at it until then it goes to the market. So gold standard says that we need to kill this fish immediately upon it leaving the water, and ideally it comes out of the water one at a time. Now the fish I'm going to show you today, at very shortly, um, was individually caught. So we had a line and a hook in the fish's mouth, and it was wonderful to see that uh, here in Spain. So basically once the fish comes out of the water, the idea is spike the fish in the head, uh, and if that process can't be done, then immediately put it into an ice slurry. And those two methods will give you a product removed of its lactic acid, because if that lactic acid resides back into the flesh of the fish, then what we see is something very similar to ceviche, where you would squeeze citrus over the top of a fish, and then it cooks from the exterior to the interior, and that's a desirable thing, right? But it is not desirable to see acid from within the fish retained in the flesh, and then it cooked from the bone to the exterior. Then, when you go and buy it at the market, you look at the flesh and the composition, and it's all milky and white, and it's got almost as if it's perspiring its own water, and that's because the fish is cooked. So, critical that the lactic acid is removed, and then important to cut the gill of the fish and bleed the fish at that point before going into the ice slurry. Once the blood is removed, then you've eliminated the opportunity for all those taints and metallic tastes and all that heavy iodine taste uh, to come out of the fish because where there's blood, then there'll be spoilage quite quickly. Um, and I know in Japan they do it in a very controlled way where sometimes the blood is left in the fish for desirable you know, flavour profiles. But for us in Australia specifically and where I'm working, then we ask our fisher um, to go out and make sure they cut the gills, bleed the fish correctly, and then into the ice slurry. So at that point where all of that effort and work has gone into just that one single fish, then it is put into a tub and we ask the fisher to put ice packs around the outside of the, the box instead of using 
shaved ice. Um, and if they have to use ice or they choose to only use ice, then we put a protective film around the fish so that the fish never comes in direct contact with the ice itself. And a lot, this is fairly conjectural. <laughs> people get quite, uh, not emotional, but there's a certain sense of uh, frustration I feel from fishers, fishmongers, people within the industry, and they think it's ridiculous that I've come out and said that you should never, ever wash a fish. Um, but to me, it is the most obvious, logical approach because if you think of osmosis, if you take a salt water out of the ocean and you go and you wash it with fresh water, naturally the fresh water passes through the membrane of the salt water and then all of a sudden you've got the salt water becoming less, less salty uh, and more fresh and the cells of the fish are flooded with fresh water, they start to swell, they break, and then we have a mushy fish that's soft. And also, the retained moisture that's within a fish is then where bacteria thrives and grows. And if we think about a meat butcher, a butcher of meat, you would not see somebody cutting a beautiful chuleta uh, under a running tap water. Um, and this is the exact same thing with fish. We've got taps running all around the world right now to speed up the process of fish so that we get our quantity and we don't really care too much about the quality. So for me at Fish Butchery, where we do all of our processing, the gold standard for us is we cut the scales off with a knife or we use a small uh, instrument basically to gently take the scales off. We keep the scales for a process and then once that happens, the organs are taken out we wipe it with paper towel instead of water, and then we put the hook in the tail and we hang it in our cool room. In reverse, what happens? The fish gets scaled with the bear trap on a stick, the really big coarse stick, and off it goes. We scale, and then the flesh of the fish starts to bruise from the aggression, uh, the amount of speed that gets put into processing a fish, because a lot of those gentlemen and women that basically process that fish are getting paid per hour that, well, per fish, as opposed to per hour that they work. So the greater their output, the greater their personal income. So it's water is used in that process to speed the whole thing up. So we've got fish that goes scaled, washed, gutted, washed, filleted, washed, and then onto ice, and then sold to you. It's wrapped in plastic, it's wrapped in paper, put in a plastic bag, you put it in your car, you drive it home, it sits in the fridge, the kids open the fridge a few times throughout the day, and then you get to the time where you eat your fish that night because nothing says that we keep our fish for longer than one day. And so we go and we cook that fish that night and what's happening is you've got water dispelling out of the fish into the pan, causing little oil droplets to splash onto the splashback of your kitchen and then all of a sudden your house smells like fish for two days after that. And to be very granular about what this is, is you've got an organic compound within a fish called trimethylamine. And trimethylamine is present when a fish is alive and then when it is killed, trimethylamine converts into trimethylamine oxide. And upon cold chain management being poorly handled with that fish along every step of the way that I've just explained, that trimethylamine oxide converts into forms of ammonia. And ammonia is what we reference as fishy fish. So when we go into, well, when I hear people come into our fish butchery that have never been there, they say, what's your least fishy fish? And the reason they're saying that is because they're talking about the smell that you have before you get the taste. And so the only way to eliminate or reduce the amount of ammonia present within a fish is by the use of acidic compounds, which is why we have specifically a French culinary repertoire that dates back centuries, which puts a half a lemon next to a piece of fish. It does brown butter, capers, lemon segments, and you know the old manure standard that goes on the sole. Uh, hollandaise that goes with smoked salmon quite frequently. You've got garlic and alliums, tomatoes in the Mediterranean. You've got all these products that are acidic in nature. And yes, they taste delicious with a fish, but they shouldn't be used as the way to fix it or as a, a way to organize and plan for inevitably this fish is going to go bad. So kitchens all around the world, and you know, I'm going to be brave here and talk to the Michelin star chefs around the world. You've got 
fish that enter into the room on day one. And then there is maybe two days after that that the chef would want to interact with that fish. And if it's not sold, then see you later. We'll get new fish in now. So it's this constant looping cycle where fresh is best. And we always need fresh. And the problem with that is that's causing a whole whole lot of issues and a whole lot of waste. So I don't care if you're buying the most sustainable fish on the planet that's got every blue tick, gold tick, silver tick next to it. If you put half of that fish in the bin, then you are part of the problem. And (laughs) thank you. (laughs) And to me personally, if there is not a solution for the whole fish, take it off your menu and put something else there. And it's a very difficult product to work with. And I'll be the first to say that. And it's a huge financial commitment because we need to talk about this without the romance and talk about it like it's a business. Because I have four businesses that require 52 at the moment percent worth of labor, which is ridiculous. And how is that sustainable as a business? But the reason I do that is to forego the amounts of profit that could be made to raise the standard and make people better aware. And I have the wonderful tool of social media to do that because I'm 21 hours flight from where we all are right now. So my voice is found within books and on social media trying to show desirable ways of utilizing the whole fish. Um, And I really love what I do because I don't have a reference point from anybody else. And we're allowed to fumble our way through it and try to make sense of it all. And along the way, we find some little nuggets that are special. And we share that, and then that shares itself, and the ripples start to go. And so one example of that was working out that the vitreous humor uh, of the fish eye uh, was really good to make ice cream. And uh, to me, that was fascinating uh, that by reading an optometry book, (laughs) strangely, uh, there was two humors, the aqueous humor, full of water, and then the vitreous humor, which has got all the collagen and protein in there. And we whisked it with sugar, and we went and we made a traditional creme anglaise, uh, but instead of the chicken egg, we used the fish eye. And what we ended up with was something viscous, and it carried beautiful lengths of flavor because of the amount of gelatine that was there. And the thing was, people were like, I don't know about trying a fish eye ice cream because I don't want to eat a fishy ice cream. This isn't about being provocative in terms of its taste, making a fish ice cream. It's about being intelligent to think that we can use fish in many other ways than the way we just see it now, which is to cut a seven centimeter square out of the center of a fillet and then the rest of it can go away. Um, Outside of gastronomy, we've got the opportunity to make plateware out of fish bones, so we can make fish bone china. And when St. Peter relocates itself early next year, we will have plateware being putting our food on top of that was utilizing all the waste bones from fish butchery. And on top of that, becoming a hotelier, which is a very new skill that I don't have yet, but I'll read more books and we'll see how we go, um, there is fish fat Uh, within a whole lot of fish uh, in Australia, specifically visceral, hard, white fat that we can remove and render, and we're making soaps for the hotel room. And that isn't to make people lather up and start to smell like, you know, the cod that it was taken from, but it's to be intelligent and to use it in a smart way where we are putting that part of the fish to work um, so that it gives us a desirable product. I'm going to bring this fish out so that I can actually have a, a tangible reference point to show you uh, and in 25 minutes, because all of this was done fairly quickly uh, with, with me coming over, um, 25 minutes really doesn't give me the two and a half hours that this took to do. So we're bringing out a big, uh, a big slab of stainless steel with a fish. So this fish, I had no idea what I was getting. <laughs> uh, and I was hoping that somebody would give me a knife, and they were very kind and did. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Cool. So yeah, firstly, I know everybody can see this behind us, but yeah, fish line. Fish line and a hook. So fish is caught one at a time, so thank you so much to those that went out of their way to really get a beautiful fish for me to use. Um, This is, I suppose, similar in, in a lot of ways to some work that you may have seen me do before, and I think what needs to be said here is uh, this is not the way that I would process my fish at fish butchery. The idea of receiving a fish is taking it, scaling it, taking the organs out, wiping it, hook in the tail, putting it into my cool room, which is static, 
which is important to mention, because I think after writing the whole fish cookbook, uh, there was especially a lot of chefs that all of a sudden became fascinated with dry aging of fish. And what went wrong in a lot of cases was they didn't think about what I'd written in the first part of the book, which is don't wash your fish. That's critical. You cannot do anything dry aged or anything matured to you know, increase the beautiful flavor profile that a fish have is if it's been under water. Um, and putting fish into a fan-forced cool room is going to basically make a fish handbag after about two days before you actually develop any kind of great flavor. So it's critical to have a cool room which is static. Uh, it sits at zero degrees. The humidity within is anywhere between 75 and 80%. And that is subject to the species in question and then how much actual intramuscular fat it has. So it is really up to the individual who's processing it to um, use their best instincts. And I know this is something that, again, we don't have a reference point to. So we're working it out as we go, and I'm trying to be as vocal as I can uh, with what we come up with. So to me personally, the idea of dry aging is the intentional moisture loss from a fish. And for us, if we have a fish, it usually use, it loses 3% of moisture per day that we have it. So after two weeks, you know, you've got, you've got a product that's bearing down on 50% moisture loss, which, again, comes at a huge cost. But what we end up with is something that is indescribably different. Like, it, it's more savory, it's more delicious, there's more fat that's prominent, and you can create identifiable flavors within a fish that may have just been seen as just some other fish. And the idea of creating desirable qualities within a fish that somebody looks at and goes, oh, no, I ate that as a kid. That was horrible. And we need to be able to get people excited about a broader catch of fish so that we're not limiting ourselves to the four or five species that we forever see on our plates. So in terms of the process that we do at the butchery, the head comes off straight away. And we put that to work inside things like fish fingers and fish pies and fish cakes and things that people feel really comfortable about interacting with. And, you know, uh, it's one thing to do this process here, which is really to split the head in half and take the eye out and just showcase this beautiful big piece of flesh that sits right on the top of the fish and then in behind it, more meat again. So for me, this is something that I would grill for all of you and I feel no one would really have any problem at all, you know, using a fork, e eating it with your fingers, getting messy and getting all the best bits. But how does that texturally translate to, and I say this respectfully, a Western audience that really just wants to interact with the fillet? And, you know, I 100% would love to be able to give my children, so I have four children, and bringing home fish fingers for them for their dinner, knowing exactly where the fish is from, how it was caught, how it was killed, and knowing that it was utilizing a part of the fish which otherwise traditionally just goes in the bin, especially in the Western world. So important to see that as being fantastic. We've got the eyes here, obviously, which you know we've made chips from, uh, and then we've, we've really just started making a whole lot of ice cream out of as well. Um, we don't have to go through all of these, but I, I put together the fins and all of the little scrappy bits there because they make wonderful stock, and we all know this. Um, things like the scales, which, again, we overlook frequently, yet they somehow make up 3 to 4% of the actual body weight of a fish that carries scales. And when you start to think 3 to 4%, okay, that's not that much, but you know, we're talking about a fish here in front of me right now, which is 270 Australian dollars. We did the maths just before, and I couldn't believe how expensive this fish is. But we're paying for the fisherman going out, catching it one at a time, risking his life, and doing you know, all the details and, and respecting the process. So you know, good fish should be a premium, and it should be a luxury. Uh, and it's then the instincts of, you know, I think there's two things. There's fishmongers, which we all know and associate with. Uh, mongering, unfortunately, carries this connotation of dealing and trading in a commodity. And if we're to commoditize fish any further, then we're going to end up with battery chickens in aquaculture and no wild fish left in the water. And, you know, the butchery side of things, which I've added into the mix, is a butcher basically is somebody who slaughters an animal and then brings value to it and brings some communication to it as well. And so for me, the idea that a butcher and a monger need to coexist together and part of what I'm hoping to do over the next 10 years is to create curriculum for 
people that want to be a fish butcher, that understand the responsibility of the fabrication of a fish and then the conversions of a fish. And the conversions really is where, you know, the fish, mon the, the fish mongers and the fish butchers will make their money. Because if you are putting all these parts of a fish to work in a desirable way, where, you know, we can take this, which is the swim bladder or the maw of a fish, seen in Chinese cookery where it gets dried out, and then upon being dried, then it's either rehydrated as a soup, which texturally is really challenging for especially people in Sydney. But what we do is after steaming, we dry it and then we deep fry it. We end up with something that ends up like this, and it's like pork crackling. And you can hear the sound of a knife going through the crackling at the restaurant. Everybody's on the edge of their seat going, I wish I, well, I hope I get some of that. So it's important to, you know, challenge people, but not in a confrontational way where it feels like there's a sense of belittlement there. So livers, hearts, spleens, intercostals, even this little tail <laughs> that we've set it up basically where we've tied everything together and then that can be roasted in the oven. But unless that comes with a method of cookery and a flavour profile and a you know, tried and tested time and all those things, then it's going to be hard to sell. Like You need to be able to converse with the customers to make sure that they understand what they're signing up for. Because if you don't know the method, then you won't embrace another type of fish or another type of cut. Um, even this part here, which I should leave it there, but I'm going to hold it. Um, this one here, this is the belly of a fish that's still got the collars and the wings at the top. And by cutting it this way, it allows me the opportunity to take all of the bones out. So all of the bones are removed from this. And I know that I'm speaking to an audience which, again, would love the idea of nibbling and chewing and getting all the little you know, bits and pieces out of it. But it doesn't, it doesn't translate. It's the, the, the insignificant tiny little pin bones and annoying little bits of cartilage, they're the challenge. And so for me, taking that away, presenting it in that way, uh, allows the, the consumer to go home and go, I'm going to put this on the grill. I'm going to put it on the grill because I've got surface area of skin. It's not wet. It doesn't smell. Now I can have fun. And to me, seeing fish more as an animal allows people, you know, into the world of thinking, well, I don't necessarily always just have to pan fry it in butter. Um, these little ones here, these are the ribs that I've basically Frenched and, and they're little cutlets that I've crumbed in breadcrumbs. And the thing that makes this particular cut very different to this cut is this one is still on the bone. So I've taken the fillet off one side, left the little bones on, just so that you can hold it, um, but then there's no bone within it, so it's a matter of eating it like a lollipop. Whereas this one here, this is like your lamb rack, so we can roast it and then carve it after it's cooked. But, you know, the labour and the beauty of this, you know, on a fish that maybe is less desirable, then all of a sudden encourages, you know, the guests coming in to think, well, I'm going to try that. Um, and I know we've got a long way to go, but to me, the theory of thinking of fish as not being limited just to its fillets, but thinking it of as a, a whole fish is super important. And the best way that I can summarise, really, is if I go and take one single fish and I use 45% of it, or even 50%, then we need another fish to realise 100%. And so if I can generate 90 to 95% from one single unit, that means I'm using one fish and getting the yield of two. And then we don't need to take another one. And... I know that that is a long, way be, a long way before we can become commercially viably thinking about this. But, you know, there's a reason why a butcher has sausages and burgers and all of these different aspects of their cooking because how far behind would the meat industry be if they were only ever just selling the beef fillet or the sirloin? Um, if we didn't know that we could eat the legs of a chicken, uh, if we didn't know that we could eat the sinewy, tough tail of a cow... Um, Methods are important. The sharing of information is important. These events are incredibly special, and I feel very privileged to be here. And I'm very grateful to Christian and the team um, for organising all of this. For me personally, on very short notice, and I really didn't think I would be talking today. Um, but again, I'm very grateful. And, and speaking to all of you, especially some of the, the chefs here, um, 
you know, blowing my mind. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.